The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune is the story of Linus Baker, a by-the-book caseworker in the department in charge of magical education. Linus has been tasked with investigating an orphanage and determining if the six supposedly dangerous children living there are likely to bring about the end of the world. Arthur Parnassus, the director of the orphanage, will do anything to keep the children safe. This book is hard to classify into genre. It's part fantasy, part children's story, part YA, part love story. But mainly, this is a book about discovering an unlikely family in an unexpected place. Welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we get to know interesting people by asking them about their favorite book. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today my friend Katie Leap Arditi is back. Just like last time she visited, Katie chose a book that ripped out my heart straight out of my chest and made me weep for days after I finished it, but in a good way. Today, Katie and I talked about her love of atmospheric books, and then we segued into our shared love of perfume and the way that both books and scents can evoke such powerful feelings. So get out your tissues, because you're going to need them when you learn about why The House in the Cerulean Sea is the best book ever. Hi, Katie. Welcome back to the Best Book Ever podcast. Hi, it's so good to be back. Very excited to be here. Oh my gosh. I was just warning you before we started recording, but I'm probably going to cry during this episode. So just let's all just be prepared for that. (laughs) Yes. I did a very casual research project into all of the conversations that I've had on this podcast. And I think the House in the Cerulean Sea has been the most mentioned of all. All this is the first time we've actually had an episode discussing it. Yeah, I think it has been mentioned most. Yeah, more than any other book, more than Harry Potter, more than Jane Austen. I cannot tell you how many people have said to me, Next time I come on, I really want to talk about House in the Cerulean Sea. Or has anyone ever talked to you about this? I just read this book and it's so good. And it's it's weirdly sort of an under the radar, everybody's favorite book. Oh, oh, and I know absolutely. it's not under the radar. I know it's a really, really famous book, but it, it's. I think what's interesting about it to me is that so many people fr- who read very different genres have said, "Next time I come talk to you," even though I just talked to you about a stabby murder book. Next time I come talk to you, I want to talk <laughs> about. Do you know what I mean? Like everybody oh, yeah. seems to really be profoundly moved by this book. Oh, absolutely. This, oh, it just covers so many different genres. And this book is a personal book. I mean, it's like, Mm -hmm. this book is like your friend that you keep close to your heart. (laughs) And how do you talk about it? You know, I mean, it's like, how how do you discuss a book like this? I I definitely have a little like almost, I was telling you earlier, imposter syndrome. Like, am I the right person to talk about this book? I mean, am I justified and qualified to talk about the enormity that this book is to me this is like an enormous undertaking to talk mm. about this book about how good it is i you know it's just goes so deep so many layers i feel like a therapist could talk about this an lgbtqa activist should be talking about this i feel like a mentor a teacher any person could talk about this book and they each each one of us is going to have a different connection to it Will you tell our listeners what it's about? Okay. So The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. It's a magical book about a average guy who's living in, from what I understand, London, a city that he works for a department that takes care and makes sure that the magical children are being taken care of in these orphanages. And this this guy, Linus, he goes around and just checks on all the kids and making sure everything's in top order, very regulation, following all the rules, very straight and narrow. He goes by the book. He is now assigned to a very top secret orphanage that not a lot of people know about. So he has to go there and check to make sure that these kids are doing okay, but there's a lot of secrecy and mystery around it. When he gets there, he finds a lot of very unique children (laughs) that have a lot of very unique talents. They are different 
shapes and sizes and beans, and they have a lot of different powers that no one's ever seen. So all of them have ended up in this one house and their caretaker, Arthur Parnassus is watching over them and guiding them to become just good people. So yeah, the guy Linus has to make sure everything's in tip top shape. And over the time of being there, he becomes a little bit less stringent on the rules and a lot more understanding and welcoming of these beautiful, wonderful, different children. I cannot help but notice that when we talked last time, you chose the book Ordinary Monsters, (laughs) which is also (laughs) about magical children living in a magical children's school. (laughs) Yes. And I I would say these two genres are so different, but these there are a lot of similarities between these two books. Is that Something you gravitate are are these magical schools and found family stories? Is this something you gravitate towards? I feel like it's the found family, mm. which I just feel like that's what is really I really gravitate towards. You know, growing up, I had a turbulent household, I would say. And to I was never home. I actually was always at a friend's house. So a lot of times my friends' families were my family. So I think subconsciously, I, you know, as an I can look at it now and realize why I'm drawn so much towards these children. Because I think you're gonna find one of these kids, either in Ordinary Monsters, but in this book too, you are gonna relate to one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, one of these kids is gonna be you. You will find yourself, you know noting, oh my gosh, that was so me as a kid. Even if they're a troll or, you know, (laughs) the Antichrist, which is one of the characters in a cute way, trust us. It it is Um, cute. I know it doesn't sound cute, but it's so cute. cute. It's very cute. Or, you know, you're a sea slug from the ocean. (laughs) Any, Any one of these characters, but, you know, their personalities come out and you really see yourself in any one of them. And it also shows you don't judge a book by its cover mm-hmm. in this book. But I do relate to these kids, especially this one even more so, just because it's they were kind of outcasts or discarded from their families and somebody else is taking them on and, they, you know, that found family. But yeah, I definitely relate to these kids. These This is like me as a kid at some points. I really always sought out my friends' families for comfort and really just education, like on manners and etiquette, how to be a good person. I like mm-hmm. learned from my friends' families. It's just, yeah. So it's a important book to me. And I guess I will always lean more towards found family <laughs> books mm-hmm. that are just cute and a little, you know, the comforting. I love that that's what you saw in it. As I was reading it, I was thinking, I, I wish I'd have had this book in my younger parenting years. Mm, because yeah. as much of a comfort, wonderful hug of a book that it is, it's to me, it was also like a parenting manual. And <laughs> and I even did that thing where I, I started trying to fit each of the children into a box. Like, well, oh, obviously this is meant to represent a very anxious kid. And this is meant to represent a kid on the spectrum. And this, oh, well, obviously this one's meant to be an LGBTQ kid. And then like a quarter of the way in, I went, you need to stop doing this because the whole <laughs> point of this book yeah. is we don't put them in the little boxes. And the whole point of the book is you just love kids for the fact that they're kids. Yes. And exactly. that's your only job is to love them. And it was <laughs> so amazing how universal it was, but also so specific. And I feel like if you are a person who's trying to love someone who mm. doesn't fit a mold, this is this is the book that shows you it's okay. It, yeah. You just love them. That's all you have to do. You just love. That's all. I mean, it's interesting. You kind of come from the parenting aspect of it. I don't have children, but I read it like I wish my friends had this book growing up. Yes. I wish this was around when I was growing up because my best friend came out and I just loved him for who he was in a rural area that did not accept that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And even my own family did not accept that kind of thing. That Mm -hmm. was not acceptable. It was when, you know, they found out that my best friend was gay. It was just, well, you can't hang out with them anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, you, I do not want them in our house. 
you know, and this is really closed minded and sad, but it was like, well, I don't want them in your car because you could get AIDS. This is how small minded oh, we were talking. Mm-hmm. And then their own parents, if they had this book, I think it would be different. It is just freaking love your child for who they are. Look at who they are as a person, not the other things around it. it. That does not matter. Who are they? Are they good? Are they good at heart? Is their intention good? I felt like there was a line on every single page. And I, I've not gone into mm. bookstagram about this, but I'm sure there is an entire subgenre of bookstagram of House in the Cerulean Sea tattoos, because oh. there was a line on every page that I wanted to tattoo on my arms. <laughs> so true. <laughs> there are so many gorgeous, <sighs> gorgeous lines. Oh, yeah. I like have so many things dog-eared. You know, <laughs> one of the quotes is, you know, and this would be a long one, but I would have this printed up and posted on my wall. Like when people enter my house, I want something, I want them to see this. I'm just going to start making posters of House in Cerulean Sea. I'll let you know if I make an Etsy. <laughs> okay, please do. I'm going to buy all of it. I know. It just says, if we are not laughing, we're crying or running for our lives because monsters are trying to eat us. And they don't have to be real monsters. They could be ones that we make up in our heads. Don't you think that's weird? And it's just that kind of thing right there. It's like, that's anxiety to me. Well, so I think this might even be the same chapter. My favorite moment in the entire book, the part that made me cry the hardest. (laughs) The boy, Sal, Mm -hmm. who shifts into dog form when he's frightened he he becomes a a small dog right yeah and i'm getting ready for it i'm emotionally getting ready for yeah, what you're about uh, to say because i think it's the same thing so they're in the town and the villagers are mean to them and he shifts immediately and linus stands with them and says essentially it's okay i know it's scary and then he names everyone in the house and he says none of those people will let any harm come to you And if you ever feel scared again, there's no shame in changing. As long as you find your way back to us, we'll be waiting here for you. And that was when I fell apart because it was that validation of it's okay to be scared. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with fear. Find your way back to us. We're not going to let anything, you know, like, I think that's the power of it is being told that the fears in your head, they're made up. But it's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If if they are frightening to you, that's still okay. I'm still here. I'm going to wait until you're not frightened anymore. It was so powerful. Yeah. As someone who's been told for 53 years, that's not a real thing, that you're making that up. Well, right. I, it doesn't matter that it's made up. It's still in my head. Exactly. Right? It's still terrifying. And that that when he said that to this little boy, it was so validating. Of- it's interesting because I have the next paragraph highlighted. And it's the part where it kind of says, it's not fair. And he says, hate is loud. And there's only a few people shouting because they're desperate to be heard. You might not ever be able to change their minds, but so, so long as you remembered, you're not alone and you will overcome. <laughs> oh, it is gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, it's just because that's the other thing in the in the country we're living in now. It's just hate is so loud. Mm-hmm. How do you know that you are still safe? How do you know that you you know aren't going to be just hurt in some way? You know from it. So you know just knowing like you are not alone, and you have people that support you. You can overcome this. Find your people, and you know. Just know that you are loved by people. That's huge. Well, and it's interesting that you said at the beginning of our conversation that you you wondered if you're qualified to discuss the enormity of it. And I think Mm. I think this book addresses that head on because the the people who are kind to the children are not necessarily the trained scholars. You know, Linus comes in, he's just a government inspector. Yeah, that's true. And he says this incredibly kind thing to this child whose mm. anxiety is so severe. And he he says the exact right thing. You are yeah. safe. He's not necessarily trained to say the right thing. He just said the loving thing. And then I kept I kept getting weepy about the woman in the town 
Mm, who, yeah. when she realized who the children were, and then one of the kids even says to her, well, you were never nice to us before. And she goes, you're right. I, I listened to what everybody else said and, but I'm ready to, I'm ready to do it now. Yeah, exactly. And you can change and you can, you know, change. you can change at any moment, any moment you can be that different person to be accepting and understanding. Let's just start a campaign to send this book to every single lawmaker in yes. Florida. Absolutely. Who yes. wants to ban everything that they're frightened of. A hundred percent. And just go, you don't this you don't have to be scared. Yeah. Even if they're sea slugs, you don't have to be scared. <laughs> yes. they're children. Exactly. Even if they're gnomes who just like to garden. <laughs> <laughs> you know? We don't have to worry. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like usually their intentions good. Get to know them. Mm-hmm. Get to, and that's another thing. Get to know these people. Stop just listening to what everybody's saying. Stop listening to whatever box that these put them has put them in. You know, there's so many points in this book where it says in the town, it's like they may look a certain way, but get to know them and what's on the inside. You know, Linus has to report back to this uh, governing, you know, people who are monitoring these kids to make sure that they're staying in line and making sure they're doing everything right. And he's at the end, he's kind of like, do you even know their names? Do you know them as people? They are not just the slug, the gnome, the wood fairy. They, these are their names and this is what they are. They're kind, they're caring. They are loyal to each other. That's what you need to know about them. Not the label that they are. Not Mm. that they're a drag queen, not that Mm. they are gay, not that they are Latinx, not that they are X, Y, Z. It's just, what kind of person are they? What is their name? That's the important part. That's key. I'm envious of anyone (laughs) who gets to read it for the first time. It's so true. And the other thing about this, which we kind of talked before we started recording, is it is very much a fun children's book. You said it's actually classified as YA for a... I mean, I would have let my kids read this when they were young. I thought it was just fun and hilarious and (laughs) I can see it being a book that kids read and just think it's a fun and funny story about a quirky school and then they come back to it as older teenagers or as young adults and go oh it's actually about really big important topics (laughs) but it's couched in a way that if you're a kid reading it you would just go this school's nuts (laughs) (laughs) Um, I thought this would be a perfect YA book for my 12 year old niece to to listen or to read. And I was so excited to give it to her. You know, we're looking at my bookshelf and I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, I have the perfect book for you because she actually struggles with, oh, emotional regulation disorder. I thought, oh my gosh, this book is perfect for you. Seriously, you'd love it. It's And I, how I explained it to her really was it's a book about these magical kids at this school. It's about friendship. It's about loving each other. And she's just so excited to read it. Now, I then start talking to her parents about the book and I was talking, which they, a little side note, they now live in Texas and they are very active in their church. They are Christian and there's, you know, some things that go with that. There is a gay romance in this book and there's also a funny, cute character (laughs) named Lucy, which is short for Lucifer, the Antichrist. Okay. So although just, as we learned in this book, we don't use that word. We don't use that word. We do not use that word. We do right. not say the A word. <laughs> because Lucy is more than just that. Okay. Right. She can overcome. So I just start kind of like lightly explaining the book to the family and the parents. And then the dad just looks at me and says, Oh no, we have to get that book back from her. She can't read that book. What and what the main thing for him was the gay romance. That was his first question. And um. I go. Yeah, I mean, it's like barely in there. It's at the very end. And I don't know, like not really. I wouldn't call it a romance, though. I mean, it does have a romantic ending. Yes. But it's not a romance. Not at all. It's nothing about the romance of the people and the adults. It is more about building a bond with the children. It's more about the children. So then I do say, oh, well, and I kind of thought about this. I said, well, there is a character in there named Lucy. And I did explain. <laughs> while we're on the subject. <laughs> yeah, while we're on subject, that things you might not want. They immediately, when they heard that, they're like, no. Which is just exactly like what it's in this book. But through the book, you learn Lucy is more than that. Lucy can overcome that. Lucy is not just what you think they are. And that's the 
importance of it. And I tried to explain that to them and they said, yeah, no, you're going to have to get that book back from her. So I had to take the book back. And that Lucy story, I mean, this is the thing that you can't impress upon people who are determined to ban books or to not allow books is you're you're making the point we learn that we are kind to children yes but if you're determined to hate a book because there's a character that makes you uncomfortable by definition you are missing the point of this book <laughs> exactly because because lucy could be let's see lucy could be the son of a great white shark <laughs> and it's unfortunate that people will just assume things about you because of the way you look right and it's it's just not true it's not who you are and that is the reason that is who Lucy is. She is somebody that if you are stereotyped for being bad just by your name or by the way you look or who you are, who you came from, that is not the case. You know, right. it's so important for that. Let's say your parent did something terrible. <laughs> right. I mean, let's just say your parent was in jail and that does not make the child bad. There are people in my neighborhood who are not exactly good people. I'm not mean to their kids. Exactly. Whereas exactly. Arthur goes, no, it's a six-year-old. It just wants yes. to play in the dirt. That's all. Yes, exactly. And those are the lessons that are repeated over and over in this book that I'm like, every freaking child, every adult needs to hear these simple lessons that they are telling children because that is what we need to hear. Absolutely. Glennon <sighs> Doyle always says that there's no such thing as other people's children. And it's one of my favorite Mm -hmm. sayings in the whole world, which is if we, what if we just stop acting like my kids come first and yours, you just have to cope with it. What if we all start acting like if all kids are doing well, we're going to do well as a society, whether I have kids or not. Yeah. And that is what this book is, is let's, how about we just take care of them? How about we not talk about their circumstances or their personality or their physical appearance? And how about we just take care of them? Absolutely. Oh, Wouldn't that 100%. be better for all of us yes. if we just, but it's very Absolutely. simplistic, of course, but I love it. I know. <laughs> I know. It's so well, I mean, I, it made me cry and it devastated me, but it was also Ugh. beautiful and wonderful. And I'm I here for you. Immediately went to my two kids who live at home. I immediately shoved it in both of their faces and went, you have to read this right now, right now, right now. <laughs> I have to talk to you about this book. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, especially when you just know that this book could make a difference in that in their lives. I mean, yeah. you can just, sometimes you can see it. It's a look in their eyes. Sometimes they're, you know, just the way that they probably are living right now. <laughs> so have you read other books by TJ Klune? No, I haven't. They, he did another book, Under the Whispering Door, and it is about grief I, I can't, I just, I don't, I can't do it. It is so Mm. difficult. My dad passed away and I kind of got around that time. It's, I'm sure it's a book that I should read. I'm sure it's a book that would help. It's just really hard for me to still get there. I'm not there yet, but I should be. The one thing I love about fantasy and magical realism is that they take big subjects and make them easier to digest. And kind of bring that magical element into it to make it a little bit easier to read. Because there is that little twinkle of pixie dust in there that make it all okay. So Under the Whispering Door, it's on my list. I own it. It's just, it's going to be a tough one for me to pick up and read. And it'll be there when you're ready. Do you have a favorite character in this book? Did one resonate with you? I forgot. Talia? The troll gardener girl. The gnome gardener girl. I think it's Talia. I think. I love her. I love her sassy mouth. I love her, (laughs) how she comes off as bossy, but she really just is really passionate and kind. What about you? Oh, Chauncey. Okay. (laughs) Can I just have a moment about Chauncey? Now, Chauncey, oh my gosh, you you have never met a sweeter freaking like sea slug. <laughs> this little charming sea slug is the most innocent little child. All he wants to do is just have a simple little job and it's his dream in life. And can't we all just encourage that? I mean, it is just so cute. He just wants to be a bellhop. That's all he wants to do. It's such a simple pleasure in life. And he just brought me so like he brought me so much joy. He is just pure joy in a bottle. 
he's the cutest little thing. <laughs> I did. I, I own the book. I read the book. But the second time around, I did the audio book of it. Mm-hmm. The narrator who does Chauncey is hysterical. The voice for Chauncey is the cutest thing in the world. Did you do audiobook by Chauncey? I did no? audio. Oh my gosh. But that I have Chauncey. the book here because I was flipping between the two because I was having such a good time. But the audio is magnificent. It's just so stinking cute. It's so adorable. It's- so Saul. Sal. The he's one who the one turns I, into the puppy the dog. And then he also is the writer. He, yes. right. Okay. Yeah. So I resonated most with him just because I definitely was, had a lot of chaos in my home and I was always, you know, sent out to stay with friends and family a lot. And it just makes you unsure of who you are and who you can trust. You know, it just makes it a little bit more, you know, you definitely want to just kind of like hide it. One point in my life, my mom was having just really difficult problems with alcohol and drugs, and I hadn't spoken to her in quite a while, in quite some time, and it was really hard for me to kind of deal with that. And at one point, I basically had to grieve my mom. She's still alive, but I had to grieve the loss of what a mom could be for me. But then I realized I was so lucky because I had so, I actually had so many moms. You know, I had so many moms. I was actually kind of lucky because of how many women in my life that were a mother to me. But that is Sal. He just did not have any Mm -hmm. place to where he felt secure. He's always been moved around to different orphanages, but he finally found this house and he's like, I just want to stay here. I have my people, I have my family. And that's how I found myself a lot. Just realizing it's not just the people who, you know, it's not just my real quote unquote, real family. Mm -hmm. It's also the family you find. And obviously you don't ever want a child to have to find that by necessity, but to come out of your childhood with that knowledge of there are other people, there are, there are a lot of people in my corner, even, even though they're not necessarily blood relation there, they will, they will mama bear the hell out of a situation. It's just so important. It's huge. It's It's huge. Yeah. To have that security, to have that safety. It's even if it's not in your own home. So this house was safety for so many of those kids. And they, they do talk about that a lot. You know, this is your home. This is not just a house where you're at. This is, these aren't just other kids. This is a home and you are not just these children who live together. Your family. You and the other, I will tell you the other moment that made me cry was they were talking about another person entering the orphanage. And the first yeah. question was, what's his name? Yes. And then they, they all kind of look at the person who asked that and said, you didn't ask what's wrong with him or what species mm-hmm. is he or what version of sea slug is he? You didn't ask yeah. any of those questions. You said, what's his name? And I, oh, God. Yeah. I didn't even notice it. That's obviously the first question you ask. Exactly. A hundred percent. And they said, I know this is the right home for them. You asked his name first. Now, what are they? Who are they? That's the key. That's the difference. It's a big change. So you and I have discovered that we are both obsessed with perfume. Yes. <laughs> Which we did not know that we had this in common. No. So, and then you told me that you actually have a perfume picked out that goes with this book, which yes, I do. makes me very happy. Please tell me what this is all about. Yes. So I did start switching my books, bookstagram and I do have a perfume review TikTok page now. <laughs> and I do a little thing called perfume pages where I choose a perfume that goes with a book. And with this book, I'm choosing Skylar, and that's the brand. And I, the scent is called Salt Air. The bottle so, even looks, it's got this perfect cerulean blue. Yes. Label. It's just a gorgeous bottle. Yeah, gorgeous bottle. On the back, it has these beautiful ocean waves. It's an, you know, a blue, just serene bottle. It's absolutely stunning. And I picked this because, one, it's salt air. You know, it's the house in the cerulean sea. So the notes in this one is like driftwood and seaweed and sea salt. And it just kind of reminded me of just and it, when you spray it, it's very bright and happy. It's it's something to where it makes you, you know, puts a smile on your face mm-hmm. like this book does. This Skylar 
company gives back. They actually donate part of their proceeds every month to a different charity. And some of them are Step Up, which is a mentoring program for children. Mm. Perfect. Feeding America, making sure that kids are getting food. Teach for America, the National Black Child Development Institute. So this brand itself is supporting things that these people in the in the house in the cerulean sea would be doing do you know it's funny because when you were on last time we talked a lot about what made ordinary monsters so atmospheric and Mm. and i was telling you like i i don't really know what i mean when i say that except that it was such an atmospheric book and so is cerulean sea a totally different atmosphere but very atmospheric and and I hadn't thought of it until you said that you have a scent that goes with this book, but scent is a part of it in my brain for sure. If you're reading a book that is done well, you can smell the salt air in the Cerulean Sea. You could smell the mossiness of London in Ordinary Monsters. And so it makes perfect sense to me that your brain goes to a perfume when you're reading a book. Yeah. As soon as you said that, I thought, oh, obviously. Right? Yes. <laughs> obviously. Perfumes match books perfectly. Yeah. And also memories, you know, it brings you back. Like when you smell something, you think of a place or a time. So, and it just goes hand in hand. And then with this book, it's it's creating such an emotional point, emotional mm-hmm. output that when you smell something that brings you to it as well, like sea salts or happiness or brightness, it's going to bring you, you know, to what you're reading. And it's interesting if I, this is like kind of a cool thing. If I'm reading the book and I'm just, let's say I'm just wearing salt air that whole time, the next time you probably would wear that same perfume, you're going to be reminded of that book. So that's something I do with vacations. I just wear one perfume the entire time on vacation. So if I want to go back to Hawaii, I'm going to put back on my coconut perfume or whatever it was, Uh you know? So I really try to attribute those things together. Oh, that is so good. Yeah. So Okay. I'm going to England, Scotland. What perfume should I wear for this trip? Because I want to, yeah, here we go. Right. So you already know I don't do anything floral. Yeah. Okay. I I love moody, Mm. musky. I, I hate when perfumes are classified as masculine and feminine, but I do tend to lean towards the ones that are called gender neutral or masculine. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So I love a unisex fragrance as well. So I too pop in my mind right away. One is Fog by Henry, Henry Rose. Rose. Oh, I love that one. And what a perfect one to take to London, right? Obviously. Right? Fog. Obviously. Fog. <laughs> yes. Fog. A hundred percent. That's perfect. <laughs> Another one is La Artisan Parfumiere, and it, it I think it's called Noir Exquise. It's like that incense burning in churches. Mm, I love that. I remember that. saying that because, you know, it's a lot of that, like, it's it definitely has that sense of it's like older churches, that d- dusty scent. I, I love it. So tell me, what are you reading right now? Okay. Oh, mm. what? You're going to come oh back my and gosh. Co- okay. You're going to freak out. It's okay. our next and episode, I bet. It is. It will be. Because again, it's a little magical and it's a lot of heavy. Okay. Hit me. I am reading Stone Blind and it is a book about Medusa's story, her real story. So the real story of Medusa is that she was assaulted. So Okay. Her punishment is for being assaulted is turning into being turned into a monster. And every time she sees a man, she turns into stone. So she's forever basically punished, never being able to find love because that she was assaulted, which is horrific. But it's a, you know, it's a newer like spin on it, a newer take. It's from her perspective. So it's by Natalie Haynes. Margaret Atwood says it's witty, gripping, and ruthless. Oh, Neil Gaiman God. says it's beautiful and moving. It's a fierce feminine exploration of female rage written with empathy. All right. I'm picking that one up. Yes. So why don't you share with our listeners where they can find you, both your book and your perfume accounts, obviously. <laughs> All right. My book Instagram account is rebel.reads. And my Instagram and TikTok is putting on the spritz. (laughs) (laughs) Putting on the spritz. (laughs) 
<laughs> Excellent. So yeah, you can find me there. Love to see you. Love to talk perfume. Love to talk books, all that fun stuff. It'll be a good conversation. Great. Well, Katie, I love talking books to you so much. And I hope you will come back. You, I mean, you're, I don't know sports things, but whatever it is, when you bat really well, like you're batting all those points. Oh, Wait, yes. What is that? Like, I'm, I'm hitting a hundred. I don't, sure. I don't know. Yeah. Hitting a hundred percent. That sounds right. Yeah. I'm know. batting. Yeah. I'm batting a hundred. I don't know. That sounds good. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're like terrible at sports. We have no clue. I listened to your hockey episode. We don't know. We don't know sports to save our lives. I'm kicking. I'm kicking 20. I don't know. It really does feel like you just kicked two touchdowns. That's what I'm saying. Yes. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) That's my favorite. Sports people are rolling their eyes so far right now. Oh, absolutely. They are. Listen, I am what I am. Anyway, my point is that, you know, you've got a perfect record on this podcast. And Mm, thank um, you. I want to thank you for introducing me to yet another wonderful, profoundly moving book. And I hope you'll come back anytime you have a book you want to tell me about. Absolutely. I'm excited to join you again. Thank you so much for having me. Bookworms, so many of you have recommended this book to me, and my only regret is that it took me so long to finally get to it. I can't wait to hear what you think of this conversation. Please share your bookish thoughts about our bookish thoughts over on Instagram at Best Book Ever Podcast. Links to everything Katie and I discussed are available in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review wherever you are listening. If you want to learn more about my weekly guests, as well as get a little peek into what I'm reading and listening to and obsessing over... Subscribe to my weekly pod newsletter at bestbookeverpodcast.substack.com. The newsletter's free, but once you get there, you'll see a couple of different paid options if you want to help me keep the candles burning over here in my reading cave. Thanks so much for joining me today, and as always, I will see you at the library. <laughs>